Oh, hello there. So, hey, just doing a little stretching before we get into our lecture for today. A little stretchy stretch, a little stretchy stretch. Ah, uh, now we should be loose for our lecture today. Our lecture today is on chapter 12 on gases. So let us get started here with part one of our chapter on gases. Now, part one of chapter 12. All right, everybody, uh, welcome back here. It is chapter 12 time. Only a few more to go, I think, after this one. Um, so we're gonna talk about gases. And remember that when we talk about gases, we're talking about the state of matter where everybody has completely broken apart from each other. They've gained enough energy to sort of fly around. As they're flying around, as they are colliding and collisions are occurring, uh, that is what we associate the pressure of gases with. And we're gonna talk about a lot of different gas laws in this chapter. Um, we also talk about gas stoichiometry and some other calculations uh, that involve gases. So we might as well get right into it. So first off, we should talk really about what substances we do find under normal conditions as gases. So when we talk about normal conditions, uh, that's usually just kind of everyday room temperature type situations where we have a pressure of one ATM. Uh, ATM is an atmosphere, as we'll talk about. That is a unit of pressure uh, and a temperature of 25 degrees Celsius. Now, under these sort of normal conditions of 25 degrees Celsius and one atmosphere, uh, we really do not find ionic compounds in the gas phase. And that's really because, as we've talked about in some previous chapters, uh, those ions, the positive ion and the negative ion, that attraction between them, uh, which is that electrostatic attraction, the opposites attract, is a really super, and you know it's strong when you use the word super, super strong attraction uh, between two things. And it is so strong that to overcome that amount of force, you would need a super... Again, super one more time there. Large amount of energy, basically, to get those guys apart. And that doesn't typically happen under normal conditions. For example, you could take like a Bunsen burner like you use in the laboratory, and you could heat an ionic compound, and it pretty much will not go into the gas phase. It will actually start to melt uh, before it will try to even go into the gas phase. Uh, you'll never pretty much get it there. Uh, but it will just sort of melt rather than go into the gas phase. And again, that's because of the really super strong attraction there between the two ions. Now, covalent compounds or molecular compounds, which as we talked about are guys that are held together by sharing of electrons, uh, they're a little bit different in terms of their properties under normal conditions. There are certain molecular compounds which are gases, just how they normally come. There's some examples there, carbon monoxide, uh, carbon dioxide, um, hydrogen chloride gas, ammonia, and methane, which is like the gas comes out when you light your Bunsen burner. Uh, but a vast majority, though, of molecular compounds are actually liquids and solids at room temperature. The main difference between a covalent compound or molecular compound and an ionic compound is the idea that a molecular compound can easier be converted, for example, into the gas phase than an ionic compound. And the reason for that is they're held together by intermolecular forces. And if you remember, we talked about intermolecular forces. And these are the forces that hold one molecule together with another. So, when we look at, for example, water, which is a common example of this, water is a polar molecule, as we talked about, and the oxygen side there is more negative. Uh, the hydrogen side really is more positive. Uh, so when you get a couple of water molecules together, the positive side of one is attracted to the negative side of another. That is, as we talked about, what is referred to as hydrogen bonding in the case of water. And that is an intermolecular force. So what happens when we have water molecules and molecular compounds, for example, held together with other molecular compounds like themselves, like two water molecules, when we start to heat it, 
what happens is we're able to just get to 100 degrees Celsius and that's enough to break the bond between the two different water molecules. That's gonna allow this water molecule to go off into the gas phase. That will allow this water molecule to go off into the gas phase. Now, remember that all intermolecular forces like hydrogen bonding, for example, uh, are much weaker than what is referred to as we talked about intramolecular forces. Intramolecular forces are the forces within an actual molecule. For example, if we look back at the water, it is the covalent bonding here, the sharing of electrons between each oxygen and hydrogen there. And intermolecular forces are always weaker than that intramolecular forces. And water is a good example of that. We know that simply because when you make pasta and you heat up that water, you do not get hydrogen gas and oxygen gas. And that's because the first bond that's broken is the one between the water molecules. If it was opposite, and the intramolecular force, as we talked about, was going to be weaker, which it is not, uh, you would actually start breaking these bonds as you would heat them, and you would get some hydrogen gas, oxygen gas, and not a good situation in that case. So um, the reason molecular compounds are easier transferred into a gas, or even actually are a gas under normal conditions, is because of their intermolecular forces and the weaker the intermolecular force, uh, the you know easier it is to kind of convert it into a gas. For example, something like methane here, it's held together by dispersion forces like we talked about because methane is nonpolar. And if you remember, dispersion forces are pretty much the weakest type of intermolecular force uh, that there is. So when you have a couple of methane molecules held together through this dispersion forces, you know, you just look at it and it's not going to hold these guys together. They're just going to be into that gas phase. And that's why, again, something like methane is normally found as a gas. Also, if you think about a lot of organic compounds, which is what methane is, a lot of those are gases. Uh, things like methane, propane, butane, right? Those are all things we, you know, can cook with, uh, set on fire in a responsible way, obviously. Uh, all these things... Um, are held together by really weak intermolecular forces, which allows them to go into the gas phase easily. So the weaker sort of the intermolecular force, the more likely that we would find that thing in the gas phase under normal conditions. And that's why something like methane is just straight up uh, in the gas phase. Also why though, if you remember, hydrogen bonding is a relatively strong intermolecular force. And that's also why under normal conditions, we find water in the liquid state. Uh, but even though it is so a relatively strong intermolecular force that holds water together with water, uh, you can still convert it into the gas uh, by applying a certain amount of energy to do so. Um, so again, that's sort of the differences between them. So the general rule is the stronger the attractive forces, those intermolecular forces, uh, the less likely that we will see something exist as a gas under ordinary conditions. And again, that's again why we do not see water normally, uh, just always in the gas phase. It's usually in the liquid phase because it is held together by that intermolecular force and it is a strong force. Um, and But we can still overcome it uh, with, you know, just a fire and 100 degrees Celsius. So what substances are found as gases under normal condition? Well, there are certain ones that we are familiar with and uh, under normal conditions, a lot of those diatomic elements and molecules, diatomic molecules, uh, which are elements are gases. So hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, and chlorine are gases under normal conditions. Ozone is also a gas, uh, O3. And of course we cannot forget our Group eight on the periodic table, which is our noble gases. Uh, those guys are also gases under normal conditions. Uh, so here we go, a little periodic table. So kind of here, obviously all in our non-metal sort of area, is gonna be our gases uh, under normal conditions. So this is also a good time to talk about the difference between two sort of words that are used, uh, a gas, and a vapor. And there is a difference in the meaning of those two words. A gas is a substance that normally is found in the gas state. A vapor 
is usually the gas form of a substance that is normally found in either liquid or solid state under normal conditions. So uh, methane gas, right? Methane normally found as gas, water vapor. Water normally found as a liquid, but can be converted into a gas. So uh, vapor, again, is usually used for something that is normally not a gas under normal conditions. A gas sort of is used as something that normally is in the gas state. Also why we don't call it like water gas, even though it kind of sounds funny, water gas. So we usually refer to it as water vapor uh, for that reason. So let's talk a little bit about the pressure of gases. Uh, we do live at the uh, bottom of the ocean where the air's composition is actually mainly nitrogen gas. So a lot of people think oxygen gas is actually the major component of air, but it's actually nitrogen is really the major component of air in terms of gas. Oxygen is next. Uh, and then other gases, argon, uh, carbon dioxide, and whatever else it may be in the air you're breathing, wherever you're at. The density of air does decrease rapidly uh, as you increase your distance from Earth. Uh, also why they pressurize, right? Planes and stuff like that when we fly. Uh, one of the most common units or one of the most common sort of properties of gases is pressure. And the gases exert, again, pressure on any surface in which they come in contact with. So the relationship sort of between pressure and sort of collisions is as the number of collisions increase, so will the pressure and vice versa. If you have less collisions, uh, you'll have less pressure sort of happening in that particular case. Now, one of the ways that we commonly can measure pressure is through a barometer, and we'll see a picture, I think, on the next slide, but uh, classic barometers, which uh, nowadays in labs you don't really see uh, because they usually contain mercury, so they've taken them out. Uh, but classic barometers had a pool of mercury and usually like a kind of a glass tube in it. And as the atmospheric pressure sort of hit the pool of mercury, the mercury in the tube would rise and you can take some measurements depending on where the mercury is. Mercury actually has an upside down uh, meniscus, kind of inverse. And uh, you would actually read it from the top of the meniscus here because, again, mercury is one of those few sort of elements, if you will, or substances that will actually create a N looking, I guess, uh, meniscus rather than the traditional U uh, meniscus. It was invented by a guy named uh, Torricelli and some very common units of pressure, which you definitely need to know, are atmospheres, uh, which are abbreviated at one ATM. One Tor, I'm assuming named after this guy there, is equal to one MMHG. So MMHG is a millimeter of mercury. And a millimeter of mercury is because when you would go to this tube, uh, frankly, there would be a ruler there and you would actually take the reading off of that tube and the barometer uh, to a lot of times inches of mercury, sometimes centimeters of mercury or millimeters of mercury. So that is what the MMHG stands for, millimeters of mercury. The important relationship between these three, which I would say is sort of the big three in terms of pressure units is one atmosphere is equal to 760 millimeters of mercury or 760 tor. That means that 760 is the big number there. If you have atmospheres and you want millimeters of mercury or a tor, which is essentially the same, uh, you would go one atmosphere on the bottom, 760 tor, or again, millimeters of mercury, and that will convert it to tor, or once again, millimeters of mercury. So you would multiply by 760 to convert it. If you are starting with tor, or millimeters of mercury, you're going to divide by the 760. And again, tor, or millimeters of mercury. And that will give you an atmosphere. 
So 760 important number, multiply atmospheres by it. You get tor millimeters mercury. Uh, divide by 760. Uh, if you have tor millimeters mercury, that will take you back to atmospheres. So oops. here are some uh, other units. Uh, pressure, uh, we see tor. Uh, we see millimeters of mercury, which is equal to one ATM. Here's our centimeters of mercury. This is kilopascals, which is a common unit of pressure. Um, this is millibars. There's also uh, a bar as well. And like a bar is basically 1.01 bars is equal to one atmosphere. It's basically milli. So you go one, two, basically go one, two, three places to the left there. And it'll be 1.013 bar is equal to one atmosphere. So uh, that's a common one some as well. This is inches of mercury. And this is also uh, what you might refer to or know as PSI, pounds per square inch. Uh, so 14.7 pounds per square inch. Again, that's a thing that we use a lot with say like your tires in your car or on your bicycle or something. You need to inflate it to a certain PSI, uh, pounds per square inch. So, um, <clears throat> Those are, uh, you know, common units of pressure. Once again, though, in chemistry, truthfully, truthfully be told, uh, these are really kind of your big three in terms of the units that you see the most of the time. Here's a uh, much better picture, I guess, of a barometer. I guess it might look sort of like that if you <laughs> look at it. Uh, but again, we have our pool of mercury, atmospheric pressure coming down on it. That's why that saying of the mercury is rising, right? Going up the tube there. Once again, you can see in this nice picture here that we do have that inverse of the meniscus here. And once again, on the side here is usually like a ruler where you can take a reading and see how high it is or the proper reading. As I mentioned before, uh, pressure is equal to force over area and one atmosphere is 101,325 pascals or 101 kilopascals. I would say most of the time in chemistry, you're probably not gonna see too much of Pascal's. Uh, some other science classes will sometimes use Pascal's or kilopascals uh, for uh, pressure. All right, so we're going to get into our gas laws now, and there's a number of gas laws we're gonna talk about here. And when we talk about gas laws, there's really kind of three variables we oftentimes will deal with, and that is pressure, that is volume, and that is temperature. Now, in a lot of cases, we may kind of keep one constant and vary some of the others. In some cases, we may vary them all, but these are the sort of the big three in terms of variables that we deal with, pressure, volume, temperature. There's a few others that get sort of inserted as we go through these gas laws that we'll talk about. So the first gas law we're gonna talk about is what's known as Boyle's Law. And Boyle dealt with uh, the pressure volume relationship. And it looks like it got a little a line in the wrong spot there, dropped too low. Just fix that there, there you go. Uh, <clears throat> and Boyle looked at, as I was mentioning, pressure and volume relationship. He held constant temperature. And what he found was that the Pressure is proportional, that's what that means, to one over the volume. So what does that mean? It means that when you have gases in a very small volume, like this, they are frankly near each other, pretty close to one another, which means they are flying around, which means you would expect a lot of collisions to occur. And what we see is the pressure will go up as the volume goes down. And again, because they're pretty much right next to each other, they have not a lot of room to go till they hit everything. Uh, that's gonna cause a lot more collisions. Again, that increase in collision is gonna cause an increase in pressure. Opposite of that is if you give everybody, say a little bit more room to fly around in, it's gonna take a little bit longer for collisions to occur. It's gonna take longer for uh, them to hit the container and that type of stuff. So what we will see here is the number of collisions will go down. And because of that, the pressure will go down as the volume goes up. So this sort of inverse relationship is as one goes up, 
uh, one goes down. Pressure goes up, volume goes down. Pressure goes down, volume should go up. The easy way to think about it a lot of times is with the volume aspect of it. Small volume, everybody's near each other, more collisions, more pressure. Larger volume, more room to fly around in, probably lower number of collisions and a lower pressure. So when we do this, uh, and as we saw here on the previous slide there, and I totally missed that completely. Um, we'll box it here. This is going to be Boyle's Law. And one of the interesting relationships that happens, say, with Boyle's Law, which you might explore in lab, is if you take the pressure measurement and a volume measurement, it will always equal a constant number. So if you have a set of conditions where you're taking for a particular gas, a number of pressure and volume measurements. So you find the pressure and the volume associated with that, and then the pressure again, and that volume associated with that. If you multiply that, it'll always come to the same number. And that's what sometimes referred to as the proportionality constant, which is what that little K means there in this case. And because of that, you can actually set it equal to two each other because they do equal the same number. So Boyle's law here is P1V1 equals P2V2. And this is at constant pressure, um, temperature, sorry. And the relationship again is as the pressure goes up, the volume goes down. And as the pressure goes down, the volume goes up. Now let's talk a little bit about the units here and the importance of what the units are on each side. And the answer is it doesn't matter. So in this particular case, pressure could be any unit and volume could be any unit as well of volume or pressure. The important part though is like kind of just normal conversions, whatever pressure you have on this side, in order for it to properly cancel out, has to be the same pressure unit you have on that side. And same thing with the other guy, whatever volume unit you got going on there, uh, you gotta have the same volume unit happening there. So. Um, you can use really any unit of pressure in this equation or any unit of volume in this occasion, in this equation, on any occasion, I suppose. Uh, but uh, it does have to be the same unit on both sides for everything to properly cancel. So that's something that you want to keep in mind. By the way, when we do see an equation like this, a formula like this with an equal sign, um, when you do have to rearrange this equation, you could just think about it uh, as fractions, even though they're not written as fractions, they're over one. And what I mean by that, let's just say I wanted to solve for P1. When we move anything to the other side of the equal sign, it will always end up in the opposite location. So V1's on top. So when I move it to the other side, it will end up on the bottom. And that's basically because we're dividing both sides by V1. So something to keep in mind as you try to rearrange some of these equations here, uh, whenever you move a variable from one side of the equal sign to the other, uh, essentially it always should end up in the opposite location of where it was. And that's just sort of a quick way to kind of rearrange equations. Here's a graph of sort of Boyle's Law relationship and what we were talking about. What we see here is at a small volume, we have a pretty high pressure, right? And at a larger volume, we have a smaller pressure, right? So again, that relationship of the volume and how much room everybody has in terms of gases to fly around is important in terms of the number of collisions and the pressure we associate with it. All right, why don't you give one a try here, take a moment and see what you come up with here. We got a balloon, it's got a volume of 0.55 liters. At one atmosphere, it goes to 6.5 kilometers and a pressure becomes 0.4 atmospheres. Uh, we're looking for uh, what is the final volume of the balloon? All right, so take a moment or two, see what you come up with. All right, so uh, hopefully you got an answer here. And one of the things I can't strongly recommend when you're dealing problems like this, especially gas problems, is a lot of times, you want to really pull out the information from the actual problem. And 
it makes determining sort of what gas law to use a lot easier sometimes you can almost see the gas law now mind you uh we only have one gas law to choose from at this point but we will have a number of gas laws by the time we're done with this chapter uh so if we just kind of pull out the information we see we have a volume that is 0.55 liters it is at sea level at one atmosphere remember atmosphere is a pressure so that actually is a pressure that is given to us it rises to 6.5 kilometers, which frankly is useless information in this particular problem. So make sure you can identify that. We have a netter pressure of 0.4 atmospheres and a volume of what we're looking for. So without knowing maybe what gas law you want to choose, you should hopefully be able to kind of see Boyle's law there. We got a couple of P's and a couple of V's. We could call the first ones ones and the first the second ones twos. Doesn't matter which one you label one and two, it doesn't as long as you keep the information that goes together together, like 0.55 and the one atmosphere stays together. So it doesn't really matter. Um, the other thing we want to look at is units. This is uh, atmospheres. This is atmospheres, which means we're good. They're the same unit. If they were not the same unit, you would need to convert one of them to get them to the same unit. So here we're going to do uh, P1, V1 equals P2, V2. Uh, we pretty much have everything other than V2. So we're going to divide this to the other side. And again, it's on top, which means when we move it over, it's going to end up on the bottom. And now we can put our numbers in the right spot. So our pressure one atmosphere. Our volume, 0.55 liters. Our second pressure, 0 0.4 atmospheres. At this point, we can see atmospheres cancel. We are left with liters, which is good because that is what we're looking for. I probably should grab a calculator. It would be helpful, I suppose, one times uh, 0.5 divided by a 0.4. Going to give you... I'm not sure. Let's try that again. It's a 0.55. Should so probably put the right number in. One times 0.55. That seems better. Divided by 0.4 gives me uh, looks like a uh, 1.375 liters. Still want to look at sig figs here. It's looking like two sig figs for everybody. Uh, so a 1.4 liters would be probably the correct answer there. Now, we want to think about also a lot of times when you're doing gas law problems, for example, you do want to kind of think about does your answer make sense? And that's why it's important to remember some of these relationships that we're going to be talking about, which is in this case, uh, Boyle's law is as the pressure goes up, the volume goes down, right? And as the pressure goes down, the volume goes up. So let's see what we got going on in this situation, in this problem. We have the pressure starting at one, ending at 0.4, which means my pressure is going down. That means that my volume and my answer that I just got should be going up. So it started at 0.55 liters and ended at 1.4. So hopefully that's good. Uh, it does, it did go up at least. So. That's correct in terms of the relationship that we should expect to see. And it's a good idea to sort of think about that because super common, clearly this lecture is brought to you by the word super, super common is uh, very much happening in these type of problems, which is people oftentimes will reverse numbers. So they'll put like uh, V1 on top where it should be V2 and kind of reverse numbers a lot and put numbers in the wrong location when they rearrange equations. So sometimes understanding this relationship can help you maybe catch something uh, that maybe uh, you did wrong in terms of calculation. All right, so that's Boyle's law. The next sort of laws we're gonna look at is actually going to be ones uh, that deal with temperature. And that is Charles law and Guy Lussac's law. And the idea here is there's, sort of two equations that we'll see. And Charles, which I'm just gonna write each of these equations out and then we'll see them in a second again, uh, which is V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2. And uh, that's really sort of as referred to as Charles law. 
this is at constant pressure. Now, Guy Lusick's law, which is sort of a version of this as well, is sometimes referred to as P1 over T1 is equal to P2 over T2. And this is at constant volume. And sometimes that is referred to as Guy Lusick's law. And in this situation, let's talk about what's going to really happen here before we go back and we'll talk about sort of the units and what things need to be in when we look at these equations. Well, let's take sort of the P1 over T1 equals P2 over T2 situation where we have constant volume. So that means that when we have in a container that is a rigid container, which means the volume will not move. It's just fixed, basically. And we have some gas molecules in there. If I increase the temperature, would we expect the gas molecules to move slower or faster? So take a moment and think about that. Hopefully you said when you increase the temperature, that means that those gas molecules now have more energy and they should be flying around faster. So what does that mean? Well, you have a gas molecule that has now gained a lot of energy moving around really fast, like I'm talking really fast here right now, and it's gonna cause a lot more collisions, right? And what we would expect to happen is because of that extra energy and because they're flying around faster, they're gonna cause a lot more collisions and we would see the pressure start to increase. Now, what would happen in this situation if we have the same sort of fixed container in our gas molecule and we lower the temperature? Well, the opposite would happen. The gas molecules just start flying around slower. So we'll have this gas molecule that's just flying around a lot slower. Dramatic slow. It's causing a lot less collisions, right? As it is moving around a lot slower and that would cause our pressure to go down. So sort of in the Guy Lussick situation here, where we have this constant volume, the effect of temperature is as you increase the temperature, gas molecule is gonna move a lot faster, gonna cause a lot more collisions, pressure should also go up. When you lower the temperature, we're gonna have everybody flying around slower, gonna cause less collisions, and that's gonna receive a result of lower pressure. So that's sort of what happens in sort of the Guy Lussick situation. What happens in the Charles Law situation? Let's kind of analyze what would happen here. Now, if we want to look at our gas molecule here, we're going to do this, and we have a gas molecule here. And let's just say we did the same thing as we did over here, which is we're going to increase the temperature, right? <laughs> So when I go to increase the temperature, as we know, the gas molecule is gonna fly around faster. And it's gonna cause a pressure increase in this situation because we're at constant volume. But over here in this situation, we're not at constant volume. So what's going to happen is as this guy is flying around faster, we're gonna get a little bit more volume for it to fly around in. So what does that do? The volume actually increases in this case. And the reason the volume increases is it allows the gas molecules to have a more room to fly around in. What that's going to do is actually keep the number of collisions constant. And that's important because we want to keep it at a constant pressure. And if the volume did not adjust here, so kind of the volume adjusts here, if the volume did not adjust, we would have this situation right here where we would see a big increase in the pressure. But the way that we're able to maintain constant pressure in the Charles Law situation is it's that volume will actually adjust and give everybody a little bit more room as they're flying around. And that will keep, like I said, the number of collisions relatively constant, and that's going to keep our pressure constant. So what happens in the opposite situation? Well, if we start out with our gas molecule in this container, which obviously would have like a movable piston that can go up or down, right, to adjust the volume. And we lower the temperature. Once again, just like up here, we would see the gas molecule start to fly around a lot slower. 
The result of that is we would see a decrease in pressure, which is not a great situation over here because we want to keep it constant. So what happens in this situation? Well, the volume also adjusts. So we drop down the volume on this gas molecule. And now what's going to happen is it's going to keep the number of collisions relatively constant and we will have our constant pressure by lowering the volume. So in Charles Law situation, it's actually the volumes adjustment that allows it to maintain constant pressure because when things go faster or gas molecules get enough energy and go a lot faster, it's going to kind of increase the volume, give everybody enough room to fly around in, and that's gonna help keep the pressure constant. When temperature drops and gas molecules are moving slower, which could cause the collisions to come down, Charles Law is going to have the volume decreasing. And when it decreases, that's going to allow the collisions to come back up and maintain where they were. And that's going to keep the pressure constant. So in one situation, like on the right there, we have no volume adjustment because it's constant. Thus, we have the pressure going up and down as the temperature changes. On the left there, it is the volume that's adjusting up and down that keeps it at constant pressure. So these are two important laws. And one of the important aspects of this law was found by our friend Kelvin. Right? And what he recognized was you could take any gas like we see here, methane. But frankly, you could take any gas you want and draw straight lines, which is not what I'm drawing, but hopefully it's straight-ish lines for any gas that you like. The goal is every single gas, if you plotted a straight line, ignore my non-straight lines, of volume versus temperature, and you went back to the temperature axis, every single line for every gas that you draw would all hit at the exact same spot minus 273.15 degrees Celsius. Now that number should look kind of familiar to you because that is the number that we use to convert to Kelvin. And that is what is referred to as absolute zero because if we convert this to Kelvin, we would add 273.15 gives us zero Kelvin, absolute zero. So Kelvin recognized the nature of this in gases that again, you could do this plot with any gas you like. And if you just take that straight line and extend it back to the temperature, it always crosses at the same spot. So the importance of that pretty much, and I guess you could thank Kelvin for this, is any gas law that you come across, and let's be really clear here, any gas law that you come across, like the two that we just saw, we're gonna talk about here in just a second again, our P1 over T1 equals P2 over T2, our V1 over T1, V2 over T2. Any gas law that has a temperature in it always needs to be in Kelvin. Let me write it really big. Yeah. And it always needs to be in Kelvin regardless of what you might think. And what I mean by that is it is very common. Sometimes you will come across problems where they will give you the temperature in a gas problem in Celsius. And you know what? They'll ask you for the answer in Celsius. So logically thinking, a lot of people think, well, they give it to me in Celsius. They want the answer in Celsius. I could just leave it in Celsius. I don't need to do any type of conversion. And you will get the problem wrong. So you do have to convert it to Kelvin, then put it into gas law and then afterwards convert it from Kelvin back to Celsius. So do not get into that or fall into that trap, which is a very common question you come across in chemistry and a very common, dare I say, super common uh, error that you see a lot, uh, which is people will oftentimes just leave the temperature in Kelvin, put it into the gas law because they're like, they gave it to me in Kelvin, I want it in Kelvin, I'm sorry, they gave it to me in Celsius, I want it in Celsius, why do the conversion? So. You do have to convert it to Kelvin anytime you have the temperature. Make sure that you do convert it. Um, so that's like the first thing you should just automatically do when you're doing a gas law problem. You got temperature, it's not in Kelvin. 
convert it to Kelvin before you do anything else. That way you won't forget to do that. All right. So we sort of talked about our relationships here uh, with Charles Law and Guy Lusick's Law. But once again, uh, let's officially talk about it. Once again, sorry about the lining went a little low. That's the volume over temperature, also equal to a proportionality constant. So once again, in these sort of measurements, we take volume over temperature, our pressure over temperature, they will equal a proportionality constant. And again, that really allows you to just set two conditions equal to each other. Uh, the volume is proportional to the temperature there. Uh, so we have again, our Charles law. And again, as we saw, this is that constant pressure, where as the temperature goes up, so does the volume. As the temperature goes down, so does the volume. Once again, these guys here need to be in Kelvin. The volume here doesn't matter. They could be in any one in terms of the volume, but the temperature definitely has to be Kelvin. And same thing with our pressure relationship one that we saw. Once again, this is that constant volume. And the temperature here, again, does need to be in Kelvin. The pressure here does not need to be any specific unit. They just need to be the same. And we see our relationship pressure goes up as temperature goes up and pressure goes down as temperature goes down. All right, so a couple more formulas there added to our list of formulas. So let's take a look at an example here. So why don't you take a moment and see what you come up with. We got a uh, 452 milliliters of gas in a light bulb. It goes from 22 to 187. What is the final volume? So take a moment and see what you come up with. All right, uh, so let's take a look. Uh, so at this point, uh, we got a few gas laws to choose from. We got our friend Boyle. Uh, we got our friend Charles. Got a little guy Lusix here. we got a, a few different ones to choose from. So again, pulling out the information, as I mentioned before, can really help you focus in on what one you might use if you're not sure. So we have an experiment where we got uh, 452 milliliters. Um, it's heated at a temperature of 22 degrees Celsius to another temperature of 187 degrees Celsius. And we are looking for a volume. Well, clearly here, we have no pressure. So that's not going to work boils or this guy. So that looks like a winner and you could kind of almost see Charles law kind of hidden in here. We kind of label it uh, maybe with the right numbers too. All right. So now we know we can use Charles law here, a little V one T one equals V two T two. Uh, we are going to be solving for V two here. So once again, opposite. So we got to move the temperature there on the right to the other side we're basically multiplying it or once again it will end up in the opposite location which means v1 t2 t1 is equal to v2 so we're ready to put our numbers in are we i hope you're saying no because this looks like celsius to me so we do have to convert it to kelvin so we have to add our 273 to each of these remember pretty much probably one of the first things you should do so we're going to do a uh, 22 plus a 273 going to be a 295 kelvin here we're going to do a 187 plus a 273 going to be a 460 kelvin now we're ready to go all right there are important things we want to make sure we get the right numbers in the right location so v1 is 452 milliliters Remember, we actually need T2 up on top. And this is what I was talking about earlier. Very common. Sometimes people put the wrong temperature in the wrong spot. And T1 on the bottom here, which would be 295 Kelvin. And uh, that means Kelvins here are going to cancel. That's going to leave me milliliters, which is good because that is a volume. And we'll take 452. We're going to times it by 460. It hit equals divided by a 295. And I think we're going to end up here perhaps at uh, 705 milliliters. Once again, we could kind of think about our relationship and just make sure, you know, things seem correct. What we know here is in this case, the temperature 
went up. And because this is Charles Law, that means that the volume should also go up. So did it. It started at 452, went to 705. So that seems good. And perhaps we didn't do any mistake. Once again, if you flip those numbers around, you might see the opposite trend and, and it might help you maybe catch, you know, an error that you might have made there. All right, let's take a look at another one here. Take a look at it. Uh, take a few minutes and see what you come up with on this particular one. All right. Uh, so once again, uh, we still have a few to choose from just to relist those up there uh, for memory's sake here. We'll do that one too here. All right. So we're going to pull off the information and see maybe which one should apply. We got a light bulb. It's got a uh, pressure there of 1.20 atmospheres. Uh, it also has a temperature of 18 degrees Celsius. We're going to heat it to uh, 85 degrees Celsius. And it looks like we are looking for a pressure here. So once again, uh, definitely volumes out uh, since we don't have that. We do have pressure and temperature. So no temperature in that one. So once again here, Guy Lusix looks like a winner of what we want to do. So we have a P1, T1 is equal to P2, T2. We'll call the first ones here ones, uh, second ones twos. We are looking for P2. So once again, we're going to send our T2 to the opposite location by multiplying it to the other side. P1, T2 over T1 is equal to our P2. Once again, just like normal, we're going to not forget to convert our temperatures into Kelvin here. So if we do all that good stuff, uh, we got 18 plus 273. Looks like a 291 here, Kelvin. We got an 85 plus a 273, 358 Kelvin. Now we're ready to put our numbers. Once again, we want to make sure we get everybody in the right spot. So 1.2 atmospheres. Our T2, which would be 358 in this case. And our T1, which would be 291. Once again here, Kelvin's going to cancel. In this case, going to leave us atmospheres, which is a unit of pressure, which is good. 1.2 times 358 divided by a 291, I think I have. And that's going to give us something like a 1.48 atmospheres. And in this particular case, this is the Guy Lusick's relationship, which we know in this case, the temperature went up, which means we should expect the pressure to go up. And it started at 1.2, ended at 1.48. So it did go up. Once again, the relationship holds of what we expect to happen here. All right, let's continue our journey of laws. We can't forget our favorite one. I don't know if it's our favorite, but our one of our favorite people, which is Avogadro's law, right? He had a number, but he kind of wanted a, a gas law as well. So why not? So when we think about our friend Avogadro, we associate our friend the mole with it. And in gas laws, the mole is equal to N. So when you see N, that is a mole, or just N by itself is equal to a mole. So his gas law is uh, V1 over N1 is equal to V2 over N2. And this actually is at two sets of conditions. This is at constant pressure and temperature. So under constant pressure and temperature relationships, V1 over N1 equals V2 over N2. V is volume, can be any volume you want. And again, here is the moles of the gas. What is the relationship? Well, sort of uh, as the moles of the gas increase, so does the volume of the gas. So you can use Avogadro's law like we see here and like we saw with the previous sort of equations and just sort of plug and chug into that equation and solve for uh, the volume or solve for the moles depending on what's given to you. So you could definitely just kind of use it as the equation. There is also a interesting relationship that is sort of derived from Avogadro's law here in gas. And it has to do with sort of stoichiometry and like stoichiometry type problems. 
uh, when you're dealing with gases that occur under constant pressure and temperature conditions. So let's take a look at sort of the application or one of the applications of Avogadro's law. Uh, it different than just, uh, like I said, uh, plugging and chugging into that equation, which you obviously can do. So equal volumes of different gases at constant temperature and pressure, they have the same number of molecules as sort of volume unit. So what this means is you could take an equation like we see here, for example, H2 uh, plus Cl2 goes to 2HCl. And if you remember when we do stoichiometry, we could use the coefficients and we basically could say, hey, there is one mole of H2 reacts with one mole of Cl2. We also say like one mole of H2 would produce two moles of HCl. One mole of Cl2 gives us two moles of HCl. So this is like that mole to mole relationship that we use in stoichiometry and can use in stoichiometry problems. Now, if we happen to be dealing with all gases and under these conditions of constant temperature and pressure, we can actually do sort of a stoichiometry relationship with this equation that does not involve moles, but actually involves volumes. So for example, we could go back to these coefficients here. And because it's at this constant temperature and pressure, we could say, hey, for every one liter of H2, for example, we would have to put in there one liter of Cl2, a volume to volume relationship. We could say for every one liter of H2 we put in there, uh, we would get out two liters of HCl. For every one liter of Cl2 we put in there, we'll get out two liters of HCl. We could do a volume to volume relationship the same way that we do in stoichiometry, a mole to mole relationship, uh, if we need to do a stoichiometry problem using gases. The benefit of this is it will allow you in certain cases not to have to do or use a gas law uh, to solve the problem that you're looking for. You could actually do more of a stoichiometry problem using volumes to get to the answer you're looking for. So. Let's take a look at this here. And here's another example here. We can say there's two volumes of H2 react with one volume of O2 gives you two volumes of H2O. Let's say we have this problem here and we wanted to figure out the volume of nitrogen, which is this guy, that is needed to react with nine liters of hydrogen at 450 Kelvin and five atmosphere. So the pressure and the temperature here are going to remain constant, basically. And that means that we could actually approach this just as a stoichiometry problem. So with all gases, we have constant pressure and temperature. We're looking for the volume of this guy. So the relationship that we could get from the equation that's balanced is not a mole to mole relationship, but we could do a volume to volume relationship. So we could say for every one liter of nitrogen, we get three liters of hydrogen. So we could very simply just start with our nine liters of H2, and we're gonna do kind of like a mole to mole situation, but using volumes. And from the equation, just like where we get our mole to moles, we could do it with our volumes. The liters of H2 will cancel, and that will give us three uh, liters of N2 would be necessary. So in this particular case, we can do a quick stoichiometry problem using really Avogadro's relationship of constant pressure and temperature and the relationship between moles and volume when you look at an equation. When we uh, talk about another gas law shortly, I will come back to this uh, problem here and show you an alternative sort of way that you would have to do the problem or could do the problem. And you'll see how much shorter it is to do it this way than to use a gas law. So put a little uh, pin in this one and we'll come back to this example and sort of demonstrate that in this, uh, a little bit later on. But why don't you try this one in the meantime? Uh, 
what volume of sulfur dioxide uh, will react with 12 liters of oxygen at constant temperature and pressure. And I think my two flew up there, so I will move them over. Sorry about that. Things kind of moved around on this lecture. All right, so take a moment here, think about Avogadro's relationship, and again, do more of a volume to volume relationship and see what you come up with in terms of stoichiometry. Okay, uh, so let's take a look. Uh, we are given uh, 12 liters of oxygen and we really wanna know how many liters of uh, sulfur dioxide, I think there. So we want, just like we would do in stoichiometry, mole to mole relationship, we wanna find the relationship between those two things from the equation and that is here and that is here. And we see from the equation that for every two liters of SO2, and once again, that just comes straight from the coefficient, uh, we would need to put in there one liter of O2. So that's gonna be equivalent to our mole to mole relationship that we do in a traditional stoichiometry problem here. So we're gonna start with our 12 liters of O2 because we are at constant pressure and temperature. We're going to do our liter to liter, our volume to volume relationship of one liter of O2 is two liters of SO2. Liters will cancel. And dare I say that looks like a 24 liters of SO2 would be our correct answer in this case, which looks like it is C in this case. So, we can use Avogadro's law, like I said, as just a normal gas law, plug and chug and put in the information. Uh, but this is a practical application of Avogadro's relationship in terms of stoichiometry when we have all gases. Uh, again, we could do a volume to volume relationship uh, versus a mole to mole relationship. All right, well, putting together all of our gas laws, up to this point, Boyle's, Charles, Avogadro's, gives us really the uh, sort of granddaddy of them all, which is uh, the PV equals NRT, uh, which is the ideal gas law. Now, PV equals NRT is different than all the other gas laws that we've seen up until this point. It is used for an ideal gas, and what an ideal gas is is pretty much all the gases under normal conditions of pressure and temperature behave ideally. And a couple of components that make it an ideal gas is under those conditions, we assume that the volume of the gas itself is small relative to the container it's in. So a lot of times in an ideal situation, we actually look at the volume of the container the gas is in rather than the volume of the gas itself. Secondly, and probably one of the other most important things that makes something an ideal gas is the idea that under normal conditions of pressures and temperatures, gases will not interact with other gases. So even if you had multiple gases together, you could assume that they're in there by themselves. Those gases will not be attracted to each other. They will not be repelled by one another. It's almost like they're in there by themselves, even though there's other gases present. So those are the two real main points that make something an ideal gas pretty much no interaction with other gases and under normal conditions we're not concerned about the volume of the gas itself more concerned about the container volume where it's flying around in the other main difference here with the ideal gas law and all the previous gas laws that we saw before is previous gas laws we had like a before and after sort of condition two pressures two temperatures two volumes here it's a one and done situation. We've got one pressure, one volume, one temperature. It is also out of all the gas laws, the most restrictive in terms of the units that you have to use. So pressure, when you use the ideal gas law, absolutely positively has to be in units of atmospheres. Volume, when you use it, has to be in units of liters. Moles should hopefully be in moles, or you did probably something wrong. And temperature, as you probably can imagine, needs to be in units of Kelvin. The reason for all of that is R. R is the gas constant. And you always have R available to you. They oftentimes will not tell you, hey, R is this value. 
uh but it's like a value you just need to know that you kind of have available to you to use and r has a value of 0 0.08206 and it has these units liters times atmosphere divided by kelvin times mole now the reason why all the other guys has to be in these units is because it needs to properly cancel out with the gas constant. So the good news is it will probably be provided to you the gas constant, which means if you look at the units of the gas constant, that should be a friendly reminder of what all these units should be when you go into here. A lot of people and a lot of books will use a rounded version of it, which is 0 0.0821. And that number is okay. I personally, when I do it, uh, use 0 0.08206 uh, because that's like the number they beat in my head and I can't get it out as much as I try. So I always go with that. But uh, a lot of people will use 0 0.0821. And again, you can use either one is perfectly fine. So this is a really important equation. It is used for a lot of applications as we will see in the rest of this chapter here. Let's talk about some other important relationships that develop with our uh, ideal gas law here. And again, I apologize that the line is not so great there. Kind of moved in the wrong spot. All right. Uh, so experiments have shown that one mole of an ideal gas will occupy 22.414 liters. This is at what is known as STP. So let's talk about what STP stands for. STP stands for standard temperature and pressure. And when somebody says in a problem or you're given, what is it at STP or this is happening at STP, they are actually giving you values. So at STP, the temperature is 273 Kelvin and the pressure is one atmosphere. So those are the pressure and temperatures that are associated with STP. So if you need to use that in say the ideal gas law, uh, you would do that by using those values for pressure and temperature. And again, they don't tell you that in problems, they just say STP. Now this relationship up here is also a really nice relationship, which is one mole, as I said, of any gas will equal 22.414 liters, but it has to be at STP. So if the temperature is not 273 and the pressure is not one atmosphere, you should not use that relationship of one mole is equal to 22.414 liters because you will get the wrong answer. You should, excuse me, only use it when the conditions are at STP. Why would you want to use it? Well, you could actually use it in certain situations to not have to use the ideal gas law. So if you happen to be at STP conditions and you're looking for a volume and you can figure out the moles, you could go right into this guy and use it if it is again at STP. And you would not necessarily have to use the ideal gas law, but you still could use the ideal gas law if you wanted to and just put pressure one atmosphere, temperature 273. So here's the deal. If you don't even want to worry about this sort of relationship, you don't have to because you could always go into the ideal gas law. So the ideal gas law can be used at any conditions you want. It could be used at STP conditions, non-STP conditions. You could use it any situation. But the one mole equals 22.414 liters can only be used at STP condition. So again, uh, you can always, as I mentioned, use uh, the ideal gas law. So uh, if you don't want to remember that 22.414 liters, you could just roll with the ideal gas law and you'll be fine. So by the way, if we do uh, solve the ideal gas law for R, uh, which would be PV over NT, which is sort of what this is supposed to be. Uh, and we put in our numbers, uh, our pressure of one atmosphere, our volume of 22.414, our one mole and our 273. That is how we actually get the value of the gas constant uh, in this particular case.
All right, so why don't you take a moment here and give this one a go. Uh, calculate the pressure in atmospheres of uh, 1.82 moles of SF6 in a volume of 5.43 liters and 69.5 degrees Celsius. So give it a go, see what you come up. Okay, let's take a look. Uh, so we have a number of gas laws at this point. Uh, we got a little oils action. I've got some Charles. Guy Lucix. Avogadro. And an ideal. All right, so let's see what we got going on here and what might make sense. So calculate the pressure. So we're looking for a pressure. Exerted by 1.82 moles. So that's an N, 1.82 with a volume of 5.43 liters and a temperature of 69.5 degrees Celsius. So clearly I got one of everything, which pretty much eliminates all the previous ones. And the only one that would make sense here is the ideal gas law. Uh, also remember you always have R available to you, not usually given to you in problems. So once again, that is a number always there for you. At this point, uh, we want to just double check a couple of things. We're going to take our PV equals NRT and we can actually just check off what we did have. We got that. We got that. We got that. We got that. So we do want to solve for pressure. So we're going to send volume to this side and divide ends up in the opposite location. It's up on top. So it'll end up on the bottom gives us P is equal to NRT divided by V. Remember that this is the most restrictive in terms of units. So we want to double check all the units here to make sure everybody is in the correct unit. So uh, moles is good. Liters is good. Uh, so we do not have to convert. And I will say in a, these type of problems, common conversions that you might have to do is a lot of times they'll give you things in grams, which means you need to go from grams to moles. A reminder that molar mass from the periodic table is what we use to do that. Other common conversions is uh, you given the volume in milliliters, which is a common unit that we collect volume in, and you got to convert to liters. So that 1,000 milliliters to liter is also a very common sort of conversion that you use in these problems. In this particular case, we're okay. We don't have to do that. We do have to do what we normally do, which is take our temperature and convert that guy into Kelvin. And that's going to be a 273 plus a 69.5. Going to give you 342.5 Kelvin. Now we're ready to roll here. So we're going to go a little 1.82. Maybe put the point there. You can use our gas constant, 0 0.08206 liters atmosphere Kelvin and mole. Gonna do our temperature 342.5 Kelvin. All of that's gonna be divided uh, by our volume of 5.43 liters. So what's gonna happen here with our units? Let's see. Well, we got liters on the bottom. Gonna take care of liters up on top. We got Kelvin on top, taking care of Kelvin on the bottom. Moles on top, take care of moles on the bottom. That is gonna leave us just atmospheres, which is really good because. We're looking for a pressure. So let's do it. Uh, we got uh, 1.82 times 0 0.08206 times uh, 342.5. Going to hit equals divided by 5.43. Going to give us our pressure of 9.42 atmospheres in this case. So once again, we still want to think about what gas law would be good. Uh, we want to make sure for sure uh, in the ideal gas law here that we have everybody in the right units. And again, uh, we want to plug that in there and, and get everything calculated. All right, let's take a look at another one here. Uh, what is the volume in liters uh, occupied by 49.8 grams of HCl at STP? Uh, so we'll give you some numbers that might be helpful. Let me find my pen there. There we go. Hydrogen, once again, from the periodic table, 1.008. And our friend chlorine, a little 3545 action. There we go. 
All right, give it a go. We're looking for a volume in this case. All righty, let us uh, take a look and see what we should maybe do here. Uh, we are clearly looking for a volume. Uh, we actually have the mass of HCl here, which is uh, 49.8 grams of HCl. Now, although we do have it in grams, we once again can use the molar mass here to take that to moles. So we will have the moles. So why don't we uh, take a look at that in just a second. We also have STP, which again is standard temperature and pressure, which means the temperature is 273 Kelvin and the pressure is one atmosphere. So I got a P, I got a V, I could get to an N, I get to a T, I always have R. So once again, this should point you in the direction of the ideal gas law, which is again, our PV equals NRT. So we do need N, so I'm gonna do the conversion here, and it looks like we're just gonna add these two together as we are looking for the molar mass of HCl from the periodic table, 1.008 plus uh, 3545, 1.008. <laughs> we punch that in right, we'll try that again for the third time. Third time's a charm, I think. 1.008 plus 3545, there we go. That looks a little bit better. That's a 3646 six grams per mole. Remember, we're using that as a conversion factor to convert the moles. We want grams on the bottom so that they cancel, dividing, and we get our moles of HCl. And we'll take our 49.8. We'll divide it by our answer there. And we'll get something like one point, I'll put it here, three, seven moles here. All right. So now we got moles and we got everything else. We're good to go. I think everybody's in the right units. So we're going to solve for V. Uh, so we're going to take P and divide it to the other side. That will give us V is equal to NRT divided by P. Putting in our numbers, 1.37 moles. Our gas constant, 0 0.08206 liters, atmosphere, Kelvin, and mole. Temperature, a little 273 all divided by our pressure, which is a whopping one atmosphere. In terms of units here, we're gonna get some canceling here. We got moles and moles, Kelvin and Kelvin, atmosphere and atmosphere, going to leave us liters as the only unit, which is a volume and quite good, I think. 1.37 times 0 0.08206 times 273 divided by one and we'll shoot a 30.7 looks like liters here of HCl in this particular case. So this is one way that you could solve this problem and this might be the way that you did it and clearly you can see it all works really well, no problem. Is there another way that we could have solved this problem? Could we have done it another way? The answer is yes, you could have, because it is STP, right? So because it's at STP, we know that always at STP, one mole of any gas will equal that 22.414 liters. So what does that mean? That means that you frankly could have just took the moles and did 1.37 moles of HCl. You could have used this relationship here that 22.414 liters equals one mole. Moles will cancel. And lo and behold, that's going to give you, not surprisingly, hopefully, 30.7 liters. Same 37.30.7 30 liters. So this demonstrates two things that we talked about. If it is at STP conditions, you could actually do the bottom calculation and avoid the ideal gas law at all costs, and you'll get the right answer. Uh, if you don't want to deal with that conversion, not a big deal. You just put the numbers into the ideal gas law like we just did on top, you get the same answer. So once again, the ideal gas law could be used in any conditions. That conversion, though, again, at the bottom only can be used at STP condition. So you can only use it. Do not use it in other situations. All right, let's talk a little bit about 
some variations on how we could calculate uh, the density and molar mass of a compound. Well, the density here of gases are usually given in grams per liter is usually the units of it. And that is equal to the pressure in atmospheres. And that is the molar mass in grams per mole times R, which is our same gas constant and our temperature in Kelvin, right? So that is sort of a shortcut formula. The molar mass down here equals the density in grams per liter. R is our gas constant. T is our temperature, which is Kelvin. And P is our pressure, which is atmosphere. So these are two formulas that you could remember to figure out the density or molar mass of a gas, where density, again, is typically grams per liter is what you're looking for. And molar mass is grams per mole is usually what you're shooting for. But frankly, who wants to remember two more formulas? Nobody wants to remember two more formulas. So why not just use the formula that you already know, which is PV equals NRT. So you can actually still use PV equals NRT. And if you understand the units that you're looking for in density and molar mass, you can actually use the ideal gas law and like a conversion almost and get to the right answer. So let's see how we could do that maybe without using these formulas. But if you want to remember these formulas, that will work for you. Uh, but remembering the ideal gas law, which you have to remember anyways, might just be the easier move. So let's take a look at these together here and sort of work through it. And I'll show you how you could kind of use the ideal gas law to get to what you're looking for. So let's take this problem here, which is we are looking for the density of this gas. And once again, we're looking for the density in units of grams per liter. It doesn't say that, but it will say that, say on an exam or quiz or type problem, but that's usually the density units associated with gases. So ultimately where we want to end up in terms of units is grams per liter. And we know a couple of things here. We do know that we have STP, which is a temperature of 273 Kelvin and a pressure of one atmosphere. We always have R, right? Which is 0 0.08206 liters atmosphere Kelvin mole, right? So we can look at the ideal gas law, which is PV equals NRT. And in this particular case, we do have pressure. Uh, we do have R and we do have T. And in this particular case, we could actually solve the ideal gas law for N over V. And when I do that, I'm going to take the V to this side, divide. And I'm going to take R and T and divide it back to that side. And that's going to give me N over V equals, excuse me, uh, P over RT. Now, what is N? N is moles, right? And V is liters. That is actually the molarity. Uh, which is abbreviated with a capital M, actually. And we'll talk about it in a couple of chapters, I think, down the road. Uh, but regardless of that, we could just look at it as units, really, at this point. So if I take my gas law information and put it into my gas law and solve for N over V, I could put my number in here, which would be one atmosphere. My R, 0 0.08206 liters atmosphere Kelvin mole and my temperature of 273. And again, all that came from basically my STP. And when I do that, I will end up with uh, one divided by 0 0.08206 uh, divided by 273. And that's gonna give me 0, 0.0, and I'm gonna take a few digits here, 446388. So what are my units? Well, atmospheres cancel. Kelvin cancel. I have liters over moles on the bottom, but when I divide it, it now becomes moles per liter. So you may be saying to yourself, how did that help me get to density? Well, if we look at what we are trying to find, I have just found one of the units I need in the right location, liters. 
So basically, I'm pretty much almost there. I need to take my number I just got and copy it right, I guess would help. There we go. Moles per liter. And what I really need to do now is, if you just look at the units we're at, moles per liter, that's good. I need to now convert moles to grams. How do I convert moles to grams? I use the molar mass. So I know it is Cl2. So I could go to the periodic table and see 3545. Cl2 would be two times 3545 grams per mole. And that would get you two times uh, 3545, 7090. So I could actually use this just as like a dimensional analysis approach. Well, I want to get rid of moles. So I'm going to put moles on the bottom and I'm going to put grams up on top of CL2, right? Moles will cancel. And now I'm in units of grams per liter, which is the density. And we will end up with, we'll go with 3.2 uh, grams per liter as our density. So here you could actually still use the ideal gas law. And in this case, we could use it to solve for basically moles per liter. And at that point, we could just use the molar mass to convert it from moles per liter to grams per liter. So what is another approach that you could do? Well, another approach you could do in this particular situation is because it is STP, just like in normal sort of gas law problems, if it's at STP, you actually don't necessarily have to use the ideal gas law. We could use our conversion again of one mole of any gas is 22.414 liters. So what does that mean? Well, we still wanna think about where we wanna end up. Uh, so we know the molar mass of Cl2 is 90, 79, 70 70.9 grams per mole. So if we do it starting with the molar mass, we actually have the grams part first, right? So now we need to convert it to liters and we could use that relationship because again, it's at STP of 22.414 liters on the bottom and a mole on top. The moles will cancel. And you will see here that we should end up with uh, the same number there, uh, 3.2 grams per liter. So, if you happen to come across a density problem where it is at STP, the easier move might be just to use that relationship and times it by the molar mass of whatever gas you're looking at. If you are not at STP conditions though, you do have to kind of take the ideal gas route. So you do have to take the ideal gas law route if you are not at STP conditions. Uh, and even if you are at STP conditions, you could still do the ideal gas law like we did at the top there. Uh, but again, it might be quicker if you are at STP conditions and want density to do sort of the bottom calculation. But again, you could still do it using an ideal gas law. And if you're not at STP conditions, you kind of have to go that ideal gas law route to get to the density. All right, so that is density. Let's talk a little bit about molar mass and again, how we could kind of use our ideal gas law to help us out as well. Um, so molar mass, right, has units of grams per mole. So ultimately that is what we wanna look for. So if we pull out the information here in this problem, we have a volume of 2.1 liters. We have a mass of uh, 4.65 grams. We have a pressure of one atmosphere. We have a temperature of 27 degrees Celsius. And clearly we always have R not given to us, but we always have it available. And again, I'm, I'm really putting it out here, the R, because I see I really only have one volume, one temperature, one pressure. So that's really telling me I'm going to probably use my ideal gas law. And that's why, again, I'm including R in this situation. So let's talk about what we're ultimately trying to find, which is our molar mass. Do we have any of this information already given to us in the problem? And the answer is yes, we have the grams right there. No calculation needed. 
That's the grams part. So what are we missing to get to the molar mass? We're missing the moles part. That is where the ideal gas law comes into play. If we just check off what we were given, we have volume, we have pressure, we have temperature, we have R. Looky there. We don't have N, which is moles, but that N is what we need to figure out the molar mass. So here we could actually use the ideal gas law to solve for N, and N would be PV over RT. Again, taking these guys to the other side. We do need to make sure, since it is the ideal gas law here, that everybody's in the right unit. So liters are good, atmosphere is good, Celsius, as we could expect, is not so good. So that's going to be a 273 plus a 27. That's going to be a 300 Kelvin. And R is good. So putting our numbers in, we will get our pressure of one atmosphere. We'll have our volume of 2.1 liters. We'll have our R of 0 0.08206 liters atmosphere Kelvin mole. And we will have our temperature of 300 Kelvin. Atmospheres will cancel. Liters will cancel. Kelvin will cancel. Hard to see there, sorry. But that says moles is the unit that we have, which will flip to the top when we divide. And we will do our 1 times 2.10 divided by 0 0.08206 and divided by 300. Going to give us a uh, 0 0.08536. That looks like a weird three. Let's try to fix that three zero there. Uh, don't think so. Fix it. Number five three zero. And these are moles. Now again, this is not the answer. This is the bottom part to what we need. So now we have everything that we need to figure out the molar mass. So the molar mass here would be, again, our grams divided by our moles. So taking our grams that was given to us, 4.65 grams, divided by our moles that we just calculated. That gives us uh, 4.65 divided by 0 0.08530. Oh, going to give us about a 54.5 grams per mole, which is our molar mass of our gas. Now I could hear the question maybe being asked, can I just shortcut it with one mole is equal to 22.414 liters? Can you do that in this case? Take a moment and think about it. No, you cannot do it in this case. And the reason you cannot do it in this case is it is not STP condition. So, this is not an STP condition. You cannot use it. And it's not STP conditions because that guy right there is 300 Kelvin is not 273. So in this case, you would have to go directly and use uh, the ideal gas law to do that. Now, uh, if this was an STP condition, and maybe they gave you a volume or something like that, like they did, you could then use it to get the moles and divide out the grams by the moles. But again, in this case, you could not use it because it was not STP. So this is a little application that you could apply really the ideal gas law to help you figure out the density of a gas. It also help you figure out the molar mass of a gas. The best way to think about it is like units and rearranging and dimensional analysis and using the ideal gas law uh, to kind of use those conversion factor to get rid of the units you don't want and keep the units you do want. All right, let's talk about uh, another relationship, which is what happens when we actually change everything, pressure, volume, and temperature. And once again, all the way through here, my lines are not in the right spot. So sorry about that. Let's put that there. So I'll just rewrite this so it looks better. Uh, we have uh, P1 over V1, sorry, P1 times V1 over T1 equals P2 over times P, P2 times V2 divided by T2. I'll spit that out right, I think. There it is. Uh, this is what is sometimes referred to as the combined uh, gas law. 
And in this case, uh, pressure could be any unit you want. Volume could be any unit you want. But as you probably know here by now, that's got to be in Kelvin. This really comes from solving the ideal gas law for R for two different situations. Let me just rewrite that so it's a little bit easier to see. And you actually can, because R is a constant, set those guys together equal to each other. And in most cases, if you don't open the container, your moles will be the same. So that again is how we get to the combined gas law. This is an important gas law for a couple of reasons. You do need to know the gas laws and the formulas as they probably will not be provided for you. So there was a lot of gas laws that we saw so far in this chapter. If you want to spend the time helpful to you and to remember gas laws, there would actually be two gas laws that I would recommend that you remember. The ideal gas law and the combined gas law. And it can really help you in all situations figure out all the other gas laws. So if you want to remember the combined gas law, which is usually just this version of it, but to show you what I'm talking about, if you want to think about the combined gas law in the other version that has the mole still in it, that might be a good one. And the reason for that is from this particular gas law, you could get every single gas law that we learned so far, except for the ideal gas law, probably. You could if you knew a couple of things, but besides the ideal gas law, you could get every other gas law that we talked about. So what do I mean by that? Well, let's talk about Boyle, right? Boyle's law deals with pressure and volume relationships, which means when you come across a problem, that's a Boyle's law problem, you will have pressure given to you. You'll have some volumes given to you. You will have constant temperature and they won't mention anything about moles. So what do you do in that situation? Well, you come over here to your combined gas law and go, there's no mention of temperature, it's constant. There's no mention of moles, you just scratch them out. And there you go, there is Boyle's law right there, just happened. If you take the combined gas law once again here, and you run into a Charles law situation, Charles Law deals with volume and temperature, no mentions of pressure, no mentions of temperature, I'm sorry, no mentions of moles. So no mentions of pressure or moles. You just come over here, do a little scratch, scratch them out. Uh, there we go, there is Charles Law right there. You do uh, Guy Lusick's Law, which deals with pressure and temperature. So you come across a problem, all it's talking about is pressures and temperatures, no mention of anything other than those things. So again, starting with our combined gas law here. Again, pressure and temperature, the only thing mentioned here, no volumes. So I'm just gonna scratch out the volumes. No moles mentioned, gonna scratch out the moles. Oh, looky there, there is Guy Lusick's law. How about even our friend Avogadro, which I don't know how often it comes across, but sometimes it might. We get to Avogadro, right? We got P1, V1, N1, T1 equals P2, V2, N2, T2. Once again, remembering this formula only. Avogadro deals with volume and moles. Pressure and temperature is constant. Scratching out pressure. Scratching out temperature, scratching out pressure, scratching out temperature. There it is, Avogadro's law. So from the combined gas law, you could pretty much get all the other gas laws that we talked about by scratching out or getting rid of anything that is told that it's held constant in the problem or anything that's not even mentioned in the problem. So no mention of moles, no mention of temperature, scratch them out.
And now you have pretty much all the gas solids that you need. So once again, if you're going to invest the time, you could do one of two things. You could remember the combined gas law way it's normally used, which is this. And the only one that you would not be able to derive is Avogadro's, which I would say doesn't come up a lot, but it still does come up. But if you just want to be safe, you could remember the combined gas law with the moles aspect of it in it. And you remember the ideal gas law. You're pretty much good to go to figure out any other gas law that you might need. And again, uh, using that combined gas law, scratching out or erasing whatever is held constant, whatever is not mentioned, you'll have all the right gas laws to use. So that's a really good way to remember all these gas laws is just to commit to these two and again, adjust it as needed. So hopefully uh, that's helpful. All right, uh, just a quick a little editing note here. Uh, I did write the wrong formula when I was doing the Charles Law uh, abbreviation. Let me go in a different color here so we can see it. Uh, just a quick uh, fix. Uh, this obviously should be T2. And I think I miswrote it when I did it. So one more time for Charles Law, just to make sure I have the right little subscripts there. Uh, we're going to do this and we're going to do this. And I think this is where I messed up. I put ones on these. These should be twos, obviously. Uh, so once again, in Charles Law situation, we have uh, no mention of pressure and no mention of uh, moles. So we'll scratch them out. And now with the right subscripts there, that is uh, Charles Law. Sorry about that. I think I just had ones in my head there, but it should have been two on that side. So just so we're clear, it's V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2. Uh, it was just a mistake because I miswrote uh, the numbers on that one. Looks like I did okay on the rest of them, so I guess that's good. All right, back to the video. So let's take a look at an actual problem here, maybe involving the combined gas law. So give it a go there. Consider a sample of oxygen gas, 27 degrees, 9.55 liters, and 2.97 atmospheres. Uh, we're going to go to 825 atmospheres and 125. What is the new volume? So give it a go. See what you come up with here. All right. Uh, let us take a look here. Uh, so we're going to do the same thing as we normally do. I'm just going to pull out some information. I got me a temperature. It's like a 27 degrees Celsius. Uh, that goes with a volume of 9.55 liters and a pressure there of 2.97 atmospheres. I have me another pressure, 8.25 atmospheres. I'm going to increase that temperature to 125. And I am looking for a volume. So again, if you're not sure what a formula, that hopefully should be screaming to you, combined gas law. All right, we got two pressures, two volumes, uh, two temperatures. So we're going to use uh, P1V1 over T1 equals P2V2 over T2. In this case, we are looking for V2. That means we need to move the other guys on the right to the other side. Once again, opposites is the quick way to do this. That's on the bottom. That's going to go to the top. And the P2 is on the top. It's going to go to the bottom. And that's basically multiplying and dividing those guys to the other side. That will give me, when I rearrange it, P1, V1, I'm moving T2 to the top. Divided by T1, I'm moving P2 to the bottom. And that will equal our V2. Now that we got it rearranged correctly, we want to put things in there. Pressure units on both sides are atmosphere, so that's good. Like normal, got to do a little conversion here to Kelvin for each of these here. Remember, we cannot go in with Celsius. So uh, 27 plus 273 is going to give us 300 Kelvin. And 273 plus 125 is going to give us 398 Kelvin. Now we're good to go. Uh, we're going to put our numbers in. Again, we want to make sure that we put everybody in in the correct location. So P1 first, 2.97 atmospheres. V1, 9.55 liters. T2 up on top, uh, 398 Kelvin. T1, 
on the bottom 300 kelvin and lastly p2 which is 8.25 atmospheres all right well atmospheres there and there cancel kelvin there and there cancel that leaves us liters as our unit and that's good because that's a volume so 2.97 times 9.55 times 398 divided by 300 divided by 8.25 gonna give us a 4.56 liters in this particular case i would say probably out of all the equations in terms of rearranging uh this one here the combined gas law gives people a really difficult time uh, so if that is the situation for you, you might want to take some time to figure out how to properly rearrange everything. And again, just remember to keep it simple as you move across equal sign, opposite location for whatever you're moving. So if it's on top and you move it to the other side, it should end up on the bottom. If it's on the bottom and you move it to the other side, it should end up on top. So that's just a really quick way, easy way, just to kind of rearrange things. Also remember that you do have to have whatever you are solving for up on top uh so uh make sure that ends up on top of whatever you're solving for all right well i think uh again not to make this super long lecture we got a little bit more to go in this chapter i think this might be a good stopping point to give you a chance to digest it i think uh we got a little bit more to go we're gonna talk about stoichiometry a little bit more uh we talked about it a little bit earlier on there with avogadro uh we'll go back to that example in the next lecture and show you again the alternative way that you could solve it but we're going to talk about stoichiometry of gases coming up in the next lecture along with partial pressures uh, which sometimes scares people but it's not that frightening and uh, we'll talk about the kinetic molecular theory of gases and i think that will wrap up uh, that chapter after that so this concludes part one of chapter 12 gases fun with gases gas laws everywhere <laughs> Uh, have a good one. We'll see you in part two. This should be coming up shortly. Have a good one. Bye-bye. Hello, and we've come to that time of the lecture where I need to reach into my pockets and come up with a chemistry joke. Let me think about what I can make try. Let's try this one. What element do you want in the audience if you're doing stand-up comedy? Helium. Because all you'll hear is hee hee hee.